Hello, good morning. How is everybody today? Very tired? It's all right. I had to drive on these roads though. How many of you drove on these roads? It wasn't terrible, it wasn't terrible, but. Thanks for coming and thanks for taking a chance on me. Uh, today we're gonna talk about this word shalom a little bit and what it means. But basically what I'm after is, why should I care about you? Why should I care about any human being? Uh, why should you care about me? Why should you respect me? Um, why should I respect myself? Really talking about the value of a human being. And so um, as we kind of get going forward, I, there's a big question out there that everybody asks. I don't care what religion, what philosophy, where you're at in life is, who am I? And, who are we as human beings? And as Christians, we may immediately go to the image of God, right? We're created in the image of God. But what does that mean? Just think about it just kind of on a basic level. Uh, and this does not come from Scripture. This just comes from philosophy. Imagine I'm holding a rock here, and I say, this rock right here, it's something different than a human being. We all know that, but, but can we explain it? And so we might say, but it, ha it has no life. It can't move on its own. It can be pushed. It can be thrown. But it, ha it doesn't have that thing, that thing called life. It's dead. And so the next level may be, well, I see this sunflower, and I see that it has life, and it, and it moves seemingly on its own, but still, that's not me. I'm something different than the tree, right? But how do I explain that? Well, this plant may have life, but does it know about itself? Does it know about its surroundings? Probably not. And so then the next level is the squirrels running around, and, and they seem to have this thing called life that the plants do, but they are aware of what's going on. And yet I'm something more than the squirrels, right? I'm aware of myself. I'm aware of my surroundings in a different way than them. And so maybe I'm on a higher level, but still can I explain it a little bit? And this is increasingly important in our world because um, why, should I, why should I treat you different than the squirrel or the plant or the rock if we're just a, I don't know, pile of molecules, if we're just material? This has huge ramifications not only for human rights, but your personal value as a human being right now, right? And so I'm sure, of course, all of you have uh, heard about Homo sapiens. We are, we are the creatures, the people that are wise. We have wisdom. We have intellect. We have rationality. We, we have language. We can talk to each other. We can communicate in a way that maybe the squirrels don't. But may I suggest that there's something even more, that we need to go to another level and that is, we are the types of beings that are justified and that, more importantly, seek to be justified. So homo justificans is the way we might say it. And so let's think about that. Let, let's think about what that means to be a, a being that is justified. First of all, Jesus Christ did not come down to to redeem this remote. He came down to justify you and me. But even more than that, we are the types of beings that want to be valued. It's, it's a part of who we are. Just think about the squirrels. They run around and they, they bury nuts and maybe, maybe they have little family structures. And, but the squirrels never got together and said, let's form a union. Or, or let's build some condominiums and maybe actually settle down. The squirrels don't lie in the night sky and wonder what it would be like to go to the moon. But we do. And why is that? I think it is because we innately understand, whether we're religious or not, whether we admit it or not, that we were made for something better than just kind of living eating, sleeping, and then dying. We innately understand that we're made for something great. And because we innately understand that, we want to be seen as valuable. 
We are the types of beings that want to be justified. I'm going to come back to that, but let's think about a different thing, and that would be the third uh, thing on your handout, and that would be we are people of word. For lack of a better way of thinking about it, we are people of words. We were created by word. This whole place was. God said, let there be light, and there was light. It's how we communicate with each other. It's how we have knowledge. It's kind of everything's just in words. Now you may say to me, oh, but I dream in color. Well, good for you, but how are you going to tell me? You're going to use words. And I don't think it's on accident then, or coincidence, that when the Son of Man came down here, that he called himself the Word. This is how God wants to deal with us, with words. Why words? Because words have to do with faith. You take somebody at their word, right? You trust them. You ever, you ever wonder why, why Jesus goes around performing miracles and then half the time he says, don't tell anybody that uh, I did that. It seems counterintuitive, right? Like if I'm building a church and um, I have somebody who can perform miracles, I'm like, yeah, we're going to put that on the billboard, right? So everybody sees. But Jesus says, don't tell anybody. I think for a variety of reasons. One, number one, he's not a horse and pony show, right? He's something else. Number two, and most importantly in my book, he wants to be known as the guy on the cross, not the miracle worker. But here's probably the reason that probably is all-encompassing. That he wants to deal with you with words. So you take him at his word. That's the trust. The goal is faith. That you would trust God. And faith comes from hearing. It comes through a message. It comes through words. So hold on to these two thoughts that we are the type of beings that that want to be justified, and we are the types of beings that are all about words in such a way that it's kind of the air we breathe and we don't even realize that, that words are so important to our existence. Okay, let's go back to justification. It's a big fancy theological word, but actually it's not that difficult to understand. You use the word justification all the time. If you try to justify yourself or your actions, you are trying to make yourself look right or valuable. So when you hear the word justification, you almost always can just think about righteousness. They're almost parallel. Really, in a lot of languages, they are. Think about it this way. If I come home today, this afternoon, and behind my vehicle, I am pulling a $50,000 speedboat. And I pull into my driveway, and my wife comes out. What do I need to do? I need to justify that purchase to my wife. Now, why am I doing that? Because I need to be made right or just. I need to defend myself. I need to justify myself. This is who we are. We are people who try to justify ourselves. Why? Because we are created in the image of God with all the rationality and the beauty and the complexity that comes with us and we understand that we are better than just the squirrels. The squirrels don't go around saying, do I look good in this outfit? The squirrels don't go around and say, we really need to, we really need to justify our existence to the people that are out there. We, we really need to build something so that we can leave our mark and be remembered in the world. They don't think that way, but we do. Because we're created in the image of God. It's such a part of my life that every single day and every single moment, whether I admit it or not, I am trying to justify my value and my existence before God and before you, to myself, and to people that I have never met. This is why eighth grade boys are the way eighth grade boys are. And I know because I was an eighth grade boy. You know how eighth grade boys pretend like they don't care about school? They do. Why do they pretend like they don't care? Because they know if they try, they risk failure. And if they risk failure, then they're going to be looked down upon. And they're not going to have value. 
And so it's easier, they're, they're not thinking about this like thoughtfully, obviously, but they've made the calculation, maybe subconsciously, that, that, that it's easier for me, risk reward, it's easier and better for me not to try and pretend like I don't care. This drive for justification is also why eighth grade girls inexplicably still want the attention of those eighth grade boys. It's why when I drive to work in the morning and someone's driving uh, slow in front of me, I say, must be nice to take a, a leisurely Sunday drive, but it's Monday morning and I have places to be. Don't you understand how important I am? I say to the person who has no contact with my inner monologue. It's also why I'll drive home that day and someone's tailgating me and I'll say, we all have places to be. Calm down. You're not more important than I am. It's why I make sure that my wife understands that I did this chore around the house and I did that chore and that <clears throat> the implication is maybe she didn't, didn't pull her weight. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Every moment of every day, I am trying to find value from the people I meet to myself and whether I admit it or not before God. But this is a dead end. This is a dead end trying to justify my existence before mere men. And before we get into the God thing for a little bit, just I'm going to say this is impossible just on the face of it. Okay. I think last week was the Grammys or the Emmys or whatever. I don't pay attention to those award shows, but I hear about them, of course. And it's always fascinated me that, that it's like there's one every week. Like nobody pats itself on the back like Hollywood. Like every other week there's some kind of award show and we got to go through this whole thing of who's wearing what and here we're on the uh, red carpet and the speeches are going to be, uh, you know, are going to be politically charged and everybody's going to try to outrighteous the next person. And I think, what a, what a bunch of narcissists. That week after week after week, it seems, in January and February, I know it's not that much, there's got to be another award show. But think about the tragicness of that compared to my life. I'm really the same way. If I would win 30 Nobel Prizes in a row, you want to know what I would want? 31. And if I made a million dollars a year, I would want two. Now, why is that? Is it because I'm a selfish narcissist? Yep, <laughs> just like the rest of us. But it's also because I'm created in the image of God with all the beauty and the complexity and the rationality that comes with that, and I will never, ever be satisfied with anything in this world. You've been told to be content every day of your life, and that is true. Contentment is a good thing. We don't deserve what we have, and we should be appreciative of that. And at the same time, you should never, ever be content, because you weren't made for this. You weren't made for death. You weren't made for a fallen world. You were made for something better. And so there is no way that you and I will ever be satisfied in this world. So I know all of you are like this, and you're saying, I wish I was up here, and I wish I had the, the better job, the promotion. I wish that I had more money. I wish that I was appreciated more. I wish I was just fill in the blank. I don't care if you get to all of those, you'll still want the next step. Because you're not a squirrel. Because you're a human being that seeks to be justified. So now let's think about the solution then. And I want you to think about two systems or two kinds of righteousness. This is from St. Paul's letters to the Romans, but it pops up all over the place. There is a righteousness by law, and then there is a righteousness by faith. I've got to keep going here. Sorry. Two kinds of righteousness. Think of two systems. System number one is I am justified or made righteous. Same thing, right or just, by a series of laws. I do this, and then I get the proper reward. I'm successful in life, I get a promotion. I'm really successful, 
I could get to go to a Grammy award show and, and get up there and, and, and uh, get a statue, right? I do something and then I'm rewarded. This is a system of righteousness by law. This is not very good for love, by the way. This is good for regular day life, right? Like, if, if you're the best, uh, if you're the best um, um, trumpet uh, player in your band, you get first chair. If you are the best quarterback on the team, you get to be the starter. If you're the best at this at your job, then you get the raise. This is, this is fine for everyday life. This is terrible for love. And if this was the system that God set up for us, he would not be father. He would be, at best, um, a business partner with us. Where we shake hands and we say, I'll do this, and then you compensate me correctly, right? And we shake hands. So then it's no longer God loves us. Rather, he is obligated to make, give us a gift. And so I did something, God blesses me. I prayed hard enough, God answered me. Um, I did enough good works, I get to heaven. It's a righteousness by law. So I'm trying to justify my value, who I am, by doing something. And this is the prison we have made for ourselves. And why I'm always trying to compare myself to the drivers on the highway, and my colleagues, and my wife, and you right now. Then there's the system of righteousness by faith. This is freedom. This is Jesus is righteous and he gives it to you. And so you are righteous. You are valuable. You are, you are perfect. You are justified. And notice that this is spoken with words. And the power of God's word will speak things into being. Let there be light, and there will be light. This is terrible in regular day life. This is the judge before the, uh, um, the courtroom and the criminal, uh, the, the mass murderer comes and you, and you say, I love you anyway, go home. This is terrible in everyday life. But this is absolutely what we need for love, an undeserved gift that we do not deserve. So, here I am, this human being baptized into the family of God with the righteousness of Christ covering all of me. So God looks down upon me and says, well done, good and faithful servant. And I go, I didn't do a darn thing. But he sees Jesus instead of me. Here I am in the right system, a righteousness by faith. And here I am trying to put myself into the righteousness by law category. It's kind of like the Israelites after they got their freedom from Egypt. And almost immediately, what do they say? Wish we could go back to Egypt, at least we had meat and vegetables. We don't do very well with freedom, do we? We want to put ourselves back into the system of law so that we find our value by us doing something rather than a spoken word saying you are valuable. And this is huge, isn't it? You can connect the dots already. That when I look at a person and I, and I see that person, here, I'll give you another how crazy I am. Uh, the, the pastors in the room will remember seminary where we had to dress in, in a coat and tie. So these schlubs... <laughs> We're dressing in this coat and tie, and we, and we got briefcases, and we look like huge dorks. And we, and we go to class, and we're, it was, it was, they were teaching us how to be professional. So I'm driving, got to stop at the gas station. Maybe I'll get a coffee and a donut, and I got my tie on or whatever. And I see this guy in his pickup about the same age, and he's the guy who's got his whole office on his dashboard. You know, like every receipt that he's ever had, right? It's all right there, and it's a mess, and there's beer cans in the back of the, the pickup truck, right? And I go to him, just stay in school, buddy. I'm saying this to myself, trying to justify myself. But here's the thing with seminary students is we had to have real jobs. And what is a, past, what is a seminary student? What, what talent does a seminary student have? Zero. 
And so a lot of us were working blue collar jobs. So I go to class and then I, I get into my dirty clothes and my work boots and I had a pickup truck too and there's probably a beer can crunch in the back too. And now I gotta go to the gas station again to get gas and I see the guy, same age, come out of the BMW with his shirt and tie and I say to myself, that guy doesn't know a hard day's work, it bit him in the butt. I put myself back into this system of righteousness by law where I have to earn value from other people's opinions. So connect the dots of your friend or maybe you that feels depression, that feels like they're not worth it, that they're invisible, all of those things. And I say to you, even if you were the most popular and successful person in the world, you still wouldn't be satisfied because it's the wrong system. Here's the system that works. God Almighty became man, perhaps one of, if not the greatest miracle of all time, the infinite and the finite, to live a pretty crappy life, to be, to be um, tortured and to die a very horrific death, to overcome death, the second, if not greatest, miracle of all time, to go to heaven to prepare a place for you, and then promise to come back, rule all things for you, and then promise to come back for you, and, and all this before the beginning of time that, that he knew you and loved you. I don't, care, I don't care how successful you are in this world. You cannot find value in any other place than what God has shown you. He values you that much. And by the way, so does the devil. And that's why they're fighting over your soul right now. You're valuable to both. So now let's think about, um, I, want, I maybe missed a slide here. Um, let's think about, before I get to shalom, I'd like to think about posture for a second. So think about, think about how you go about life. And, and this is, this is actually, there's a connection between the body and your attitude sometimes, isn't there, right? This is why your mother said, stand up, right? Put your shoulders back, right? Don't slouch, not just for your health, but it gives off an impression, doesn't it, right? So let's think about having my shoulders, I'm curved inward rather than being curved outward. When I'm curved inward, I'm looking at myself, um, we had a professor who called it navel-gazing. You're looking at your belly button all the time. And when you're curved inward, you're thinking about how you're doing in life. You're kind of absorbed with yourself. And when you try to find your value, you're looking in yourself. And when you look in yourself, it's not, it's not often a very pretty sight, is it? I mean, Jesus... Jesus is very clear that what's inside us is rotten. And, and if I'm trying to find Jesus inside, um, you know, I'm, I'm usually just going to make a Jesus that looks kind of like myself. Because I'm looking inside for what I think I need. I'm, I'm curved inward. And there's really two basic results of that. One is kind of a spiritual, if not a physical um, and psychological depression. Or, worse, a narcissism. <laughs> and that you're pretty good, you've convinced yourself. And quite frankly, you're bugging the rest of us. Right? Um, you are a resounding gong, constantly telling me about your spiritual resume. I don't want to hear it. Right? But God curves me outward. And this is an action God does to me. And when he does that to me, it's usually in a backwards way. It's usually from suffering or from the law. He slaps us in the back of the head. That's why suffering can be a very good thing, right? Where he says, wake up where you can't, you can't find hope anymore inside, and you're finally forced to look up and say, help. Now when you're curved outward, you see three things. You see your righteousness that is outside of you. You see Christ. That's my value. That's my righteousness. That's why, it's that's why you should respect me. <laughs> and I should respect you. The second thing you see 
is you see a world that has been given back to you. Now, in this system of righteousness by law, I look at everything, including human beings, and I see it, whether I admit it or not, I see it in this system of how I can be valuable. How can I use this? I see, I see time that I can manage so that I can be a good person. And I see, I see the world, uh, if, I'm, if I'm very uh, conscious about the environment, as we all should be, I see it as doing something right to make myself more righteous than the next person. And, and when I help the little old lady across the street, why am I really doing it? So I can go like this. And so I see my work as a step to my own value. I see the people around me as these are the people that make me popular. These are the people um, that are going to praise me. Whether I admit it or not, I start to see the world in part of this system of law. And then I don't see it as a gift to enjoy. So when I'm curved outward and I go, Jesus saved me. My value is secure. I know where I'm going. I actually start to see this is a gift for me to enjoy. And maybe I only got 6,000 steps on my Fitbit today. Ah. And maybe I didn't get that promotion. Ah. And maybe this didn't happen. Ah. It's all right. It was all a gift anyway. And here's the third thing I see when I'm curved outward. I see my neighbor, perhaps for the very first and when I see my neighbor, I start to see other people, and I see them in the lens of Jesus Christ. And so that gets us um, a little bit to vocation. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, maybe I'll just jump ahead just for a little bit and a tease in vocation in case we don't get there because we run out of time. Vocation is a calling. So um, I have a calling from God to be Father to be husband, to be pastor, to be professor, to be friend, to be son. These are my callings. And I'm thinking about it this way, that God says, I would like Amanda Berg, that's my wife, to be loved and adored and put on a pedestal. What I'm going to do as God is, as my, as my modus operandi, my MO has been from the beginning, is I'm going to use something physical, he almost always exclusively uses something physical and something that's really not that great. So I'm going to use Mike to love and adore Amanda. So it's really God's love through me to my wife. I'll screw it up and have and will, but it's still his love through me to my wife. And it's a privilege just to be a part of this equation. Right? So now let's think about if I am curved outward and I see my value is already secure. Don't really care if I get a promotion or not that much. I mean, I still do, but you know. I see that this world is all gift. It's not law to me. I don't have to follow any laws. Um, I'm free from that. Uh, this is all gift to me. And because I'm righteous now, I'm going to want to do what's right. And now I see my neighbor in the first place. Let's put that curved outward position into my calling as professor. So I stand up before freshmen. Ugh, freshmen. Um, and and I got to teach them the same basic things over and over and over again. My wife's a kindergarten teacher, and she'll come home and say, you know, I, we, 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 we got almost all the kids able to write their names and and got to get them to remember to write it on their pieces of paper every time. I'm like, I know. Tell me about it. Like, you're in college now. Please write the name on your paper, right, on this test. Um, now, if I look at them and I see them in the sense of righteousness by law and my life in that first system, I look and I say, I would like to uh, write books and be this professor with a tweed jacket and patches and smoke a pipe. This is my goal in life, right? Okay. But they don't just, they don't just pay people to do that, so I gotta have a job. And so my job is to teach these dum-dums. And then I have enough money and I got a library and in my, in my time when I'm not teaching, I can do this kind of thing that I wanna do. So I look at the students in front of me as objects to be used. They are a stepping stone to getting to where I want to be 
so that I can, be ju- I can justify my existence. I can go to my wife and go, well, that's why I spent tens of thousands of dollars on getting these degrees. <laughs> See? <laughs> right? I justify myself. But if I see it in the realm of vocation that God says, I want these people taught, and I suppose I could just zap information into their little brains, but I'm a physical being too, and so I want, uh, I come in physical ways, so I'm going to do it through you, Mike, to them. Now I see this as my greatest privilege. I see these people in a different way. I value them. I don't use them. You use things, not people. Now they're people. Now they're people created in the image of God. They have value to me in a very profound way. All right. Um, Maybe I'll finish the vocation thing um, since I'm down that road and we'll come back to Shalom. Maybe I should have done it this way to begin with. What do I mean by vocation is a Christological endeavor? Remember, this, there's this curious passage in, in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus talks about the end times. And he says, I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats, right? Those who've done good and those who've done evil, right? Which is terrifying because we've all done evil. Ah, but remember that it is a righteousness by faith and a righteousness by law. That's the split. Those who have faith are righteous. They did do good works. Jesus did them for them, Right? And those people who are the goats are the people who say, I'll take my chances. Here's my my resume, God. Judge me for who I am. You don't want to be in that situation. So when Jesus describes the goats and the sheep, um, he says, um, I go to the sheep and I say, you fed me when I was hungry. And you you gave me cold water when I was thirsty. And you visited me in prison. And you gave me clothes when I was naked. And the sheep are like, "Yeah, we, we didn't do any of that. And Jesus says, whatever you did for the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. So if I am working at Denny's and I literally bring a cold cup of water to the table that I'm serving, I have served Jesus. And when I do the dishes at my home, I am loving Jesus because I'm loving my wife and my children. Christ to you and Christ to me. So when I serve other people, I'm serving Christ. And this only works really, or it works most beautifully when you're not even thinking about that. It's just who you are. And because in vocation, um, it is... Christ using me as a waiter to give food to somebody else, then the waiter is Jesus Christ to the people being served. So the waiter sees the people who are being served as Christ, and the people who are being served sees the waiter as Christ. Christ to you, Christ to me, a Christological endeavor. Does this not change the way you look at other human beings? Does this not give you a small delight in your work? Does this not lift you high above to a startling degree, as one author said, high above anything that this world could give you, the mere adulations of man? If I know that I am doing God's divine work and Christ is right with me, Whatever I'm doing, if I am driving people around as an Uber driver, if I am cleaning the bathroom at home, if I am doing computer whatever, if I am a janitor, if whatever it is, if it's Christ and me doing this, it's divine work. And whether nobody else knows it, I know it and God knows it. That's my value in my work, in my day-to-day life. Christ to you, Christ to me. So I think about it, this is the Father's economy of love. So uh, Martin Luther said something uh, that's kind of famous. He said, uh, the angels sing in heaven uh, when a father uh, cleans a dirty diaper. I like that he used father there. And uh, when he changes a dirty diaper, the angels sing in heaven. Well, of course, does God want clean rear ends? Of course he does. 
He knows how many hairs are on your head. He cares intimately about what you eat and your health and your, and your schooling and your job and your, all of that stuff. And so when he sees a father change a dirty diaper, he says, yes, this is what I wanted for this child. Of course I did. And so what that says to me is that every vocation, I don't care where you are, I don't care if, if you're the senator from the state of Wisconsin, which we human beings put up here, or if you're the janitor working at the U.S. Capitol building, which we unfortunately put down here, God sees them as the same. Because he's doing both work. And he does not say one is better than the other. And quite frankly, we dumb human beings to go like this. And he's like, if nobody cleans up, you know disease goes rampant. And I don't care how many people are senators. People, right? So he puts it up there. So if I'm down here in society, I'm not really when it comes to what God sees and what God thinks. And doesn't that really matter? So I don't ground my value then in a promotion, in an award, or whatever. How shallow is that? Right? This also gives me great pride in my work. All right, everybody's cleaned the bathroom, I would assume. And so um, now that I have great pride in, in what I'm doing, and this is God's work, and this doesn't always happen because I'll screw it up, but there are times when you, when you take pride and you find a craft in your job, even cleaning your bathroom. So you go and you got a system and you start from the top with the mirrors and you work all your way down and you're getting everything right. You even take, you know little plastic things on the toilet that cover the bolts? You even take that off and clean around there, right? Why do you take pride in that? Because someone's going to notice, they're not going to notice. Because you're going to get award the best uh, bathroom cleaner ever? No, there's no red carpet for that. You just do it because that's who you are, who God has made you to be getting lost in your work because you find value in it. You find value in a job well done. It really is a game changer when you think about it. There's more to be said about that. Um, but finally, this is divine purpose. You have a divine purpose in wherever you are in life. I don't care where you are. I don't care what the world says. You have a divine purpose and vocation. So you're valued, number one, creating the image of God, loved by God, the system of righteousness by faith. Number two, in your jobs, your vocations right now, you are integral to God's fa the, the Father's economy of love. Whether the world thinks so or not. Whether you think so or not, you are. And why do we know this? Because God said so. Take him at his word. All right, I'm going to close with this, this idea of shalom. What we're really after is shalom, whether we know it or not. Shalom is a Hebrew word that usually is translated peace. So um, <clears throat> if I'm looking at uh, the word shalom, I see peace. But in Hebrew, that word shalom can mean something much more than just peace. Think about peacetime versus wartime. So peacetime is where the economy is rolling. Um, we are, we're building museums and schools. Like, I can go get a loaf of bread and not pay $300 after waiting three hours in line, like, you know, it was in the, in the Depression or during, uh, you know, the aftermath of World War II in certain places, right? Um, I, I can send my kids to school with a pretty good idea that they're not going to be hit by sniper fire. It's the way things should be. And there are four components to the way things should be, shalom. And these words in English um, often are used to translate the Hebrew word shalom in the Old Testament, uh, although not freedom. The first one's freedom. If I'm in jail, I cannot have shalom. It's not the way it's supposed to be, whether it's my fault or not. That's not shalom. I need a certain amount of security, right? I need to be safe for it to be shalom. And I need a certain amount of prosperity. If my whole existence today is trying to scrounge up just enough food to feed my children, it's hard to have shalom. It really is. Now, by the way, all of those come through vocation. Why do, how do I get freedom, prosperity, security? 
through the vocations of government and police and all those kinds of things. God working through them for me. Shalom is the Hebrew for a Greek concept, I would suggest, called edaimonia. The Greek concept is often translated into English, happiness, or the good life. And it comes all the way to America in this phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But what you and I think about happiness is not what the founding forefathers thought about, and certainly not what the Greeks and the Hebrews thought about. We think a personal euphoria. Notice the curved inward navel gazing. How do I feel today? How do I feel about my value? It's a dead end. Rather, when our founding forefathers wrote The Pursuit of Happiness, they meant homesteading, uh, participating in, in civil, building schools and churches and hospitals and universities, going out and getting a job and starting a family and all that kind of stuff. And so I think the best way to think about shalom, identomenia, or happiness is flourishing, is human flourishing. And this is what we're all after, whether we know the word or not, to flourish. So how do you flourish? Well, you first need freedom. You need to be free from trying to justify yourself by the mere adulations of man. And that's the cross of Christ that says, my dear, I value you so much that I'm willing to do this for you. You will need the fourth component of human flourishing, and that is purpose. You need a reason to get out of bed in the morning. That purpose comes in your vocation, where God says, your job is valuable. It is integral to my economy of love. I don't care what anybody else says. You matter because you are Christ to them. This is how I get stuff done, through you. So when you think about this, two, lack coming, uh, two final thoughts. One is we talk about the glory of God too much. I'm so sick of hearing about the glory of God. Yes, it's a beautiful, uh, uh, th it's a beautiful biblical concept. But when you just say glory of God, you're like, i got to do everything so God is honored. That makes God a narcissist and me kind of going around like, i got to give credit, i got to do this for God's glory. It's shorthand. God's glory, to work for God's glory is shorthand for this. I am so free in Christ that I don't have to justify myself that I love my neighbor and that's to God's glory. And I do it without even thinking about it. I'm not the, I'm not the child who does stuff so I can go home to daddy and say, are you proud of me, daddy, now? As if my father was a tyrant. Rather, I am out in the world, not concerned about the love of the father, the love of the family. I'm so free from that, that my father and my mother look back and go, I'm proud of that boy. I'm proud of my girl. Because they're not even thinking about pleasing me. The second thing, God doesn't have a plan for you. God doesn't have a plan for you. He has a plan for your neighbor. Oh, he's got a plan for you, but it's going to come through all of your neighbors as he works to love you. So all of these people that you serve, you could never repay what God is doing through you through these other people. Just think about what it means to be in this room right now. There were carpenters. There were, there were carpet layers. There were financiers. There were bankers. There are people that run this. I can go on and on and on and on just so you could be here right now. You reap so many gifts. And because God gives them to you, you don't have to feel guilty about it at all because it's free and it's wonderful. God doesn't have a plan for you. He's got a plan for your neighbor. Look up and look outside. And when you look up and you see your neighbor and you see your righteousness in Christ, you'll also see this world given back to you and you'll realize, oh, he had a plan for me too. And it was all gift. It was all gift. This is flourishing. This is freedom. I'm out of time. Thank you so much um, for letting me ramble for 45 minutes.